Why do we eat more than what we need? I mean, most of the time we know that we're eating too much, we know we're full, yet we reach out for another slice of that delicious chocolate cake. And it's not like we don't know what the health consequences are, we know. We know that having too much sugar and fat is bad for our bodies and that it can ruin our health in countless different ways. So why do we reach out for another slice of chocolate cake knowing the consequences for well? Good question. More than 1 in 3 adults in the United States are obese. The World Health Organization tells us that we're in the midst of a global obesity epidemic and blames the crisis of ballooning waistlines on a lack of physical exercise and rising consumption of energy-rich food. Think chocolate cake. The truth is, of course, a lot more complicated than what's being presented by the World Health Organization. Food for the vast majority of human history was very scarce, and human brains, just like the brains of countless other animals, evolved to maximize energy intake for the sake of survival. And this can take a pathological form for some people amounting to what some scientists and healthcare professionals have termed a food addiction. So, can your brain really be hooked on food? Well, let's find out. My name is Hashem and I'm a University of Cambridge graduate and student doctor and this is Doctor Tell Me Why. If you're new here then just know that I post weekly medical videos about the latest groundbreaking medical research, I also tell you guys about all these fascinating medical conditions and give you top tips on how to live stronger, longer and healthier. So if that's the kind of content that you want to see here on YouTube, then make sure you hit that like button right now and make sure you subscribe to the channel for more videos just like this. And of course, in the description below, you should find links to all the different scientific studies that I reference in this video, so you can have a read of them if that's what you want to do. There is a reason why scientists think that people showing symptoms of compulsive eating behavior may be addicted to food in a similar way that someone else may be dependent or addicted to drugs. Food and drug addiction are actually remarkably similar. In both, you tend to find a loss of control over food or drug consumption to the point where it appears compulsive, and those affected will continue to engage in this behavior regardless of what the consequences may be. Think things like weight gain, social and physical impairment, as well as mental health issues. There is also a preoccupation with food and getting your next fix, which can range from harmless anticipation, as in looking forward to your next meal, to pathological obsession. And there is a substantial amount of research indicating that when those overeaters go for extended periods of time, without consuming their favorite foods as in when they are dieting, they begin to show symptoms of anxiety, irritability or extreme nervousness. Or what some scientists like to call an affective withdrawal. Which isn't great because it's precisely this affective withdrawal that they're experiencing that actually pushes people to relapse and overeat in an effort to relieve their symptoms of anxiety, irritability and nervousness that they're experiencing. Think of it as an urge so powerful that you find yourself completely helpless in front of it and so you end up self-medicating. But how does that struggle play out in the brain? Well, picture this, you've just had lunch with friends and you're absolutely, absolutely full, but you have a soft spot for gooey chocolate cake and on the way home you just happen to pass by a shop that sells, well, you guessed it, gooey chocolate cake. Are you going to go in and buy some of that chocolate cake? Well, that's a decision that your prefrontal cortex will have to make, an area of the brain that's involved in decision making, planning and moderating your behavior. But it's not as straightforward as it seems, because more often than not, your prefrontal cortex will be in two minds about whether it should have that chocolate cake or not. First, you have the dorsomedial prefrontal cortex which tells you to go for it and follow your base instincts and have that cake. Your ventromedial prefrontal cortex, on the other hand, will temper those feelings and gives a more thorough assessment of whether that cake is a good idea after all. Maybe it reminds you of what your doctor told you about having too much sugar or too much fat in your diet, or how desperately you want that beach buddy that you saw on Instagram before the summer arrives. <sighs> Sorry about that, I think I'm just projecting a little. Ever so slightly. But the fact is that scientists were able to demonstrate that individuals who are addicted to either food or drugs showed abnormal activity levels in their prefrontal cortex compared to healthy controls. People with a higher BMI had decreased baseline activity in the prefrontal cortex compared to healthy controls, 
and enhanced food cue induced activation, meaning that when presented with a delicious meal, their brain cells fired up significantly more than healthy controls. In fact, even after they'd lost the weight, the scientists were able to predict who in that group would gain the weight back by looking at their brains and observing the pattern of brain cell activation. Pretty scary if you ask me. And it doesn't stop there. Scientists were actually able to reduce cravings in a group of obese women by electrically stimulating the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the same area of the brain that we mentioned earlier that is thought to be responsible for that go and eat signal. But the prefrontal cortex doesn't operate alone. To make up its mind about whether it should eat some more or just stop, the prefrontal cortex requires information, information it receives from none other than the hippocampus. The hippocampus is a complex brain structure that is both powerful and pretty vulnerable, and has long been known to play a vital role in learning and in memory. It's actually one of the first structures that appears to be affected in patients who are suffering from Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia. And if you've watched my video about patient HM, then you definitely know for a fact just how important the hippocampus is in forming and consolidating new memories. And so the hippocampus just happens to be both structurally and functionally interconnected with the prefrontal cortex. And there is an ever increasing amount of research which seems to suggest that the hippocampus may play an important and vital role in the control of appetite. When the function of the hippocampus is impaired in animal models, typically through introducing lesions or temporary inactivation, these animals completely lose control over their appetite and we start observing shortened meal intervals, meaning that the animals begin to eat more frequently. It also appears that they lose the ability to tell when they're full, which results in increased weight gain. And this actually should have never been surprising. The hippocampus is rich in glucagon-like peptide 1, or just GLP-1, receptors, and these receptors, they respond to food cues or satiety signals from your gut. Basically, a signal that comes from your gut, all the way up to your brain, that tells your brain that you're full and that you should probably not eat anymore. To not have that chocolate cake, even if it's gooey. Moreover, scientists were able to reduce food intake and body weight through pharmacological activation of the GLP-1 receptor, possibly paving the way for future treatment of compulsive and binge-eating-like behaviors. And another potential treatment in the pipeline is memantine, a drug that's commonly used to treat moderate to severe Alzheimer's disease has been recently found to reduce binge and uninhibited eating. Interestingly, it has also been found to reduce spending in compulsive shoppers or what the media would call shopping addicts. So it seems to play a holistic and global role in cognitive control rather than directly acting on and affecting appetite or food intake either. But the hippocampus may play another vital role in dictating whether or not you reach out for a particular food. Remember when I said that the hippocampus was vital in acquiring and consolidating new memories? Well, if you have good memories about having a particular meal at a particular restaurant, then you would be more likely to order that meal the next time you're in that restaurant, regardless of just how full you may be. So, in conclusion, the reason you find it so difficult to resist the gooey chocolate cake that's presented in front of you, despite being pretty full, is due to a combination of memory, expectancy, inhibitory, and decision-making processes all coming together to determine whether you'll reach out for that chocolate cake or not. Despite the length of this video, I wouldn't want you guys to think that this was a comprehensive review of the neurobiology of overeating. Far, far, far from it. For example, I haven't really touched on the basal ganglia, which plays a vital role in habit formation and in emotional eating. As in eating when you're upset to comfort yourself, which is something that I think that we've all done before. Ice cream, anyone? But who knows, perhaps I'll come back to this topic sometime later in the future and look at the role of the basal ganglia in overeating in more detail. If that ever happens, there would be only one way for you guys to find out, and that is for you guys to subscribe to the channel right now. I have plenty of great videos planned that you guys would not want to miss out on. Tell me what you guys thought of the video in the comments below. I always like hearing from you. Love you all to bits and see you all next week.